today we are going to talk about kidney replacement therapy. Essentially, I will make the slide very simple and I hope that by making it very colorful, it will help everyone to understand. So perhaps I will start with the first question uh, of tonight. Does anyone know what is the normal kidney size for healthy Malaysian adults? Have anyone have any rough idea? Do you all want to you know, uh, comment in the in the chat box? Well, I was just allowing other people to come here. Yeah. Roughly, anyone have any idea about normal kidney size? Eight to ten. Mm. Yes. Uh, Cool mention eight to ten. Okay. Any anyone have any answer? Three into six into nine. Uh, Sorry again. Three into six into nine. Six six is width, nine is a uh, length. Inch, uh, CM. CM. Six to nine CM, you mean? Yes, sir. I see. All right. Has anyone else have a different opinion other than these two? Six are width, width, nine is length. I see. How about length? Length is 9. 9 cm. Okay, so almost close, 8 to 10, right? So I think mm -hmm. uh, generally, I think this is perhaps the most basic question that we should ask ourselves when we see any ultrasound kidney result. I know ultrasound is definitely an operator-dependent thing, but actually looking at the kidney uh, ultrasound sometimes can help us to have a gauge that whether we are dealing with some form of uh, chronic kidney disease. Okay, so this is a study which I think is quite interesting because it's, uh, it's a local study done by a group of radiologists and they have published that uh, back in 1989. That's like more than, you know, uh, uh, I think that is about 5,000 5, plus patients that they, they scanned and documented. But interesting fact to note is that what they found is you can see that generally male has slightly, slightly larger kidney size than female, but it's not very significant. But what you can see for both uh, male and female is that you can notice that Actually, the left kidney, as compared to the right kidney, the left kidney is actually larger, slightly larger, okay? And we know that the left kidney is actually situated uh, at a different position compared to the right kidney, right? So, and that actually corresponded to the left kidney actually being slightly larger, okay? You can see that. And generally, the cutoff that we use is about uh, 8 to 10, which is correct. But generally, I think anyone that have kidney size of less than 9, should give us a suspicion of whether you're dealing with chronic kidney disease because the normal kidney size should actually more than 9 cm regardless of female and male at different age for adults, okay? So I would like to start off with uh, a few concepts. Perhaps the first concept is what is the main function of kidney? So the main function of kidney actually can divide into four main functions. I think this is very fundamental, very basic. I, I, I used to give this kind of uh, sharing session to medical students in the past, but I feel that this thing, we have to remain uh, remind ourselves again and again that actually we have to go back to basics at some times because basic will actually help us to understand a lot of things as the things get uh, complicated. So seven main functions of the kidney, we all know that uh, kidney actually uh, uh, maintain a fluid balance to achieve euvolemia, also maintain electrolyte balance, especially for uh, Electrolytes, main electrolyte will be the uh, the potassium, the sodium. Third one will be the acid base balance, especially the bicarb. And the fourth one is perhaps the byproduct metabolism of removal. That includes urea, creatinine, toxin, and even cytokine. And you can see that these four function is the one that dealing with a lot of physiology, a lot of molecules. As compared to the last uh, three function of the kidney, in which kidney actually secrete three types of hormone. First is actually called renin, in which it controls the blood pressure through the activation of renin, angiotensin, and aldosterone system. And second is actually uh, secrete EPO, which is erythropoidin, that helps in terms of uh, our red cell balance and production. And the last, perhaps, will be the activation of vitamin D with the, through the enzyme 1-alpha-hydroxylase, okay, to activate the vitamin D, and that will actually help with calcium and phosphate balance. So the normal calcium to phosphate balance that we are talking about is actually about 2 to 1 ratio. Generally, when we see a patient, our calcium level should be in this ratio, a normal person. Like we are talking about calcium of probably about 2.2 to 2.4 with the phosphate of generally about 1. Okay, So you can see that the first four function is more to fluids, electrolytes, 
some molecules, uh, acid base, or, or even some form of uh, toxins. And the remaining three function is actually about hormones. Okay, so you can see that any form of dialysis, regardless of peritoneal or, or hemodialysis, only actually replace the first four function. Okay, including uh, fluid balance, electrolyte balance, acid balance, and also byproduct metabolism, and therefore having an extreme level of uh, uh, values that the body cannot compensate will actually be the indication for dialysis. So that include, if you're talking about fluid balance, you're talking about refractory fluid overload despite medical therapy. Like for example, you give very high dose of uh, diuretic like fusamide, it doesn't help, then you really have to consider to do a dialysis. And next, second thing is the refractory electrolyte. Commonly, the one that will kill first is the potassium. The refractory hyperkalemia and acid base balance, like what I mentioned, refractory metabolic acidosis. Okay, and the fourth one is perhaps the one that opens up a lot of window for, for indication that will include uremia, be right? the symptomatic uremia that includes uremic pericarditis, uremic encephalopathy. We have seen a few patients that actually admitted to cardio because of a uh, symptomatic pericardial effusion and the urea creatinine was really high. and and yeah, and th this kind of patient, the, the main goal is actually not, not to tab it urgently with the so high urea causing more complication and bleeding. It's actually to, to actually dialyze the patient and the pericardial effusion will actually resolve or even improve. Okay, next is perhaps uh, some of the non-so typical indication for dialysis. That will include uh, removal of water-soluble toxin. Remember that our dialysis machine or even our preterm dialysis can only remove things that can bound to water, not albumin or protein. Okay, this is another important concept. And the remaining two indication is perhaps uh, having a lot of data nowadays that these two indications are more increasingly recognized. First is the severe sepsis because of removal of cytokine storm and as well as inflammatory mediators. We will talk about it in detail later. And the next one is perhaps acute liver failure. The main issue uh, with acute liver failure is actually the build out of ammonia. What happens in acute liver failure is that ammonia start to build out in the body as the liver function decline. And this ammonia, when it gets deposited into the brain, and what happens is that among our brain cells, uh, we have our neurons and also glial cells. Glial cell is a supporting uh, uh, brain cells, right? So one, only one glial cell actually uh, able to metabolize the ammonia into glutamine, which is a less uh, toxic substance. So what happened is that uh, because the ammonia start to deposit in the brain and all will get deposited in the astrocyte, and this astrocyte will try to convert as much as it can into a glutamine. And conversion of astro uh, ammonia to glutamine will actually lead to the astrocyte have increasing osmolarity because uh, glutamine is a very osmotic substance. So that will actually lead to astrocyte swelling and eventually cerebral swelling and eventually impact in neural transmission. Everything will go haywire and therefore actually will lead to encephalopathy and the prognosis is very bad. So the idea for saying this is actually we want to prevent the accumulation of ammonia to begin with in acute liver failure. So that's why one of the indications to start uh, dialysis, especially CKRT, is actually the acute liver failure, okay? So the, how about remaining three function? Like we mentioned, once the dialysis machine or peritoneal dialysis replaces the, uh, the first four function, the remaining three function is essentially the medication that we're going to start for the patient. For example, BP control, we're going to start uh, antihypertensive, uh, red cell balance, we're going to start iron, make sure the iron store is actually adequately replaced, followed by uh, starting of ESA. And the new data also coming up with this kind of HIF inhibitors in which it can actually uh, increase our production, uh, actually uh, promotes the kidney to produce more ripple cell through the hypoxia and reduce oxidative stress kind of stimulation. Okay, but the data actually for now is not, not very strong. There's multiple agents. Uh, Malaysia at the moment, we don't have. But sooner or later, maybe we, we may have get access to this uh, new medication later on. And the last, perhaps, is the calcium phosphate balance. Uh, when we talk about mineral bone disease in kidney, it's always a difficult topic. It, it, it itself can actually become a big topic. Uh, but essentially, if you want to break down simple, we are talking about phosphate control and we are talking about IPTH control. Okay, parathyroid control as well as phosphate control. We know that mineral bone disease can progress from secondary hyperparathyroidism and subsequently become tertiary autonomous secretion of parathyroid hormone due to nodular hyperplasia of the parathyroid gland. So the goal is actually to control the phosphate 
reduce the phosphate so that it won't cause unnecessary stimulation to the PTH gland. And that actually uh, uh, breaks the vicious cycle. However, recent evidence has shown that phosphate is not the only trigger to mineral bone disease. Early study has shown that there's a lot of more factors that, that actually triggers this mineral bone disease even at the level of CKG stage 3. That include Kyoto pathway, that include FGF23. But all those things, I think, is beyond our knowledge. We just need to know a very basic thing. And when we talk about phosphate control, the first idea is perhaps, importantly, when we talk about low phosphate diet, I had to emphasize a low phosphate diet, and then followed by phosphate binder, be it a calcium or non-calcium-based phosphate binder. And subsequently, at the same time, we also need to start patient on the IPTH medication to, con to reduce the IPTH stimulation. That would include vitamin D analogs, uh, calcium mimetics versus parathyroidectomy. So this is just a very basic concept of you know, how we approach to chronic kidney disease as a whole. And when the chronic kidney disease approaches end-stage kidney disease, then what is the next step? Okay, so when we talk about mechanism of dialysis, this is the second important point perhaps I want to share with everyone because I realized that perhaps the knowledge of dialysis and kidney uh, support is not really conveyed to anyone of us. Uh, even some, some of us that underwent uh, with, uh, nephro rotation or kidney rotation, we, if we don't have much teaching, you may not be exposed with all this kind of uh, basic stuff, which I think is important for us to understand. Okay, so we talk about mechanism of dialysis, meaning there's only four. We are talking about ultra filtration. Essentially, it just means a jargon for osmosis. Huh? It basically means we are talking about water, okay? Water flow of the water through a semi permeable membrane from the low solute to the high solute concentration. That's what the definition of osmosis is. But in, in, in the field of kin kidney or nephrology, we call it ultra filtration, okay? Second concept is diffusion, particularly passive diffusion from high concentration gradient to low concentration gradient through a semi permeable membrane as well. And this too is a very simple concept, okay? But we, the, the concept of dialysis does not stop at this two. There's another two important concepts that is importantly and increasingly recognized, and that will actually affect a lot of uh, mode of dialysis if you, if you understand the concept. The third mechanism is what we call as convection, okay? So what is convection? We will talk about it later. And what is absorption? It's not absorption. This is really a correct spelling in case someone is asking why not it's just ad instead of ad it's called absorption okay we will go through one by one outer filtration everyone knows it just go from the low solute concentration more water go to the area of less water through the the semi-permeable membrane there's no question to that there is this osmotic gradient okay so the second concept is also very simple diffusion basically we're talking about small particles that are fit enough to pass through the pores uh depending on the size of the pores that will depends on the the dialysis machine, they have the different dialyzer with different pores. When we talk about flux, a concept of flux is that a high flux dialyzer has a bigger pore. That means they will allow more uh, bigger molecule or so-called a uh, more molecule to be passed pass through. So that is what we call a high flux dialysis. Low flux meaning the pore is smaller in size. That is the concept of flux. Okay, But generally, it actually utilize the concept of diffusion. Okay, from higher concentration to lower concentration. Okay, so the third concept perhaps I would like to spend a bit more time is convection. This is important is because a lot of uh, uh, subsequently when we go into beyond a uh, normal hemodialysis or parietal dialysis, like for example, you're talking about CKRT, you're talking about plasma exchange, you're talking about uh, CBVHDF, all those kind of therapy actually requires a lot of convection principle. So convection is actually essentially is also a uh, movement of solute from the high concentration through a low concentration. But what is interesting is that you can see this substitution fluid. So we will add a pressure, okay? We will add more fluid into the blood, okay? To give a, a push, okay? That's what, the push is something what we call as transmembrane pressure. So it gives a push to the particle that is uh, bigger in size, but because of this push, a bigger particle can also go past this uh, normal membrane. And this is what we call as trans pressure transmembrane pressure gradient. The higher or the more substitution fluid you are giving, what we call as replacement fluid that you are giving to the blood itself, you will push more particles to go from blood into the filtrate. That's a very important concept because it actually allows us to remove some of the middle molecules that is actually bigger size than the, our usual dialysis, uh, that, uh, our, dialys uh, our dialysis filter, or we call it dialysate. Okay? So this very important concept. And the fourth 
concept, the mechanism is perhaps absorption. So basically, it's just it's just like a sticker. Lah. Every filter have different capability of absorbing different kind of particles. Okay, particularly they can be endotoxin, they can be cytokine, they can be some form of molecules. But this absorption actually they just create a special layer of membrane, making out of different kind of chemicals, and that particular substance can actually stick to the wall and it will never get uh uh it will never get back into the blood system meaning is in a way is a using a filter layer itself as a filter to to filter out all this uh, kind of substance this is why it has absorption you want to remember simply it's just a sticker like, huh? and this absorption is good because you can remove those middle molecule or even large molecule that really cannot pass through the ball because we know that if we really give large molecule to pass through the pore, that will include albumin. Then the whole body knows albumin already. Huh? It's very dangerous. Patient can die. So we cannot allow too large molecule to go past the membrane easily. Okay? So when we talk about uh, dialysis, we talk about pores, we talk about mechanism, we must talk about sizes of the molecule. Okay? Sizes of the molecule is actually very important because it depends on what we want to remove. When we talk about dialysis, you can see that generally can divide into three types. It can be small molecule, middle molecule, or large molecules. Okay, so you can see that small molecule is some 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 molecules that is less than five kilo delta. Middle is somewhere between five to fifteen kilo delta, and large will be more than fifteen kilo delta. You can see that all our electrolytes are really small and negligible. They can pass through very easily, and including vitamin B, all those things can be passed through easily with dialysis. Middle molecule is the one that can be a bit tricky because middle molecule has the most cytokine uh, component because most of the cytokine is actually ranging between this size or even some are actually larger, especially uh, if let's say some endotoxin or exotoxin can be even larger. And when we talk about middle molecule removal, we are actually using a benchmark of beta 2 microglobulin as a benchmark of middle molecule as a representative, a filter that can remove uh, a beta 2 microglobulin is what we call a filter that can remove middle molecule. Okay. And you can see that as the size increases, those substances, uh, molecules like albumin, uh, those substances like uh, light chains, those are the ones that is very difficult to remove unless you use a specific form of dialysis. So the principle of dialysis is very simple. If you're talking about small molecule remover, you're talking about you are just going to use diffusion, right? And diffusion alone will help to remove all that. But when you're talking about middle molecule removal, you need a bit of convection to push all these things past the pores. Okay. And lastly, if you're talking about large molecule, you can also use a uh, convection, although it may not be very effective, but most of the time you will need to add on with absorption. So you can see that what is different between hemodialysis and hemofiltration, we will go through in a short while. Okay. So kidney replacement therapy essentially is uh contains four pillars. When you talk about KRT, or in the olden day, I like to call it RRT. But now that the KDGO advocates us to use kidney alone to replace renal, nephro, or what's up. So we will try to use uh, kidney replacement therapy. It's mainly divided into these four pillars. Don't forget that there's such thing called conservative uh, comprehensive care, which is the renal palliation. Okay, Always need to bring the discussion between these four pillars. And a patient may go through hemodialysis, change to peritonalysis, change to transplant, then fail, then go back to peritonalysis. All this cycle can repeat here and there, okay? So let's start with hemodialysis. Just a very brief introduction, not to bore everyone with the history, but you can see that the dialysis itself go through a very uh, very significant milestone, okay? When we're talking about 1854, uh, when Thomas Graham actually first introduced the concept of osmotic force, he realized that in the lab, it can he can appreciate that from uh, there is something called uh, concentration gradient. There is something that molecule can go from high concentration to low concentration. This is just a concept that he introduced, and that actually warrants him to 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 earn the title of father of dialysis because that forms the basic principle of dialysis. Right, we're talking about diffusion. Okay, and in nineteen thirteen, these three people actually use a cellulose uh, membrane, and they actually put hirudin in the olden days. It actually derived from the leeches, right, to prevent blood from clot. And they do some animal study. They found that actually uh, the filter, this kind of colloid uh, cellulose filter that they use can actually filter out some of the things uh, from the body, but not very clear. It was until 1924 in which the Josh Haas performed the first human dialysis. This is the first human dialysis, also using the colloids, but unfortunately no one survived. 
okay? And he tried to modify it many times. He's actually doing a human experiment. Up, up to seven or eight patients only, he managed to uh, change his idea and then modify here and there. Subsequently, from, from Hirudin, he changed to heparin. And he is the first one that used the heparin, okay? And he is very well known because he's the first person that actually dialyzed a human, although the outcome is very poor. You can see that before 1924, most patients that have kidney disease will die. Huh? They cannot survive. Okay, there's no dialysis machine at all. You can imagine if we are living at that era or oh, die, most patients will die. We don't have CKD clinic to see. We don't have, we don't even talk about transplant or anything. Okay, you can see that the, the outcome for patients with kidney disease is very poor. Okay, so in 1943, William Koff actually came up with a very important uh, concept. He actually used a lot of this rotating drum and it's a very huge machine to try and then they connect to multiple plastic uh, tubes and then they try to do a, a lot of this uh, rotation thing to make sure that the, uh, to stimulate a concept of filter. This is a very big filter. And what makes this successful is that he managed to use this on one patient and that patient managed to recover AKI completely upon discharge. So that gives a lot of a lot of shocking uh, news to everyone, thinking that, oh, 1943 almost, so there is a possibility to survive if you have kidney disease and you underwent this form of artificial uh, treatment, okay? It was it was further be modified and modified again until 1948, in which some of the material, they changed from, you know, those conventional stuff to latex and to, uh, to a better pump. And you can see that uh, subsequently more people actually uses more things to modify it and let's say like previously it's just a plastic tubes. Now they start to change into some form of cellophane membrane. And then further on, it was until 1960, Frederick Q actually introduced a parallel plate instead of a uh, rotating drum, making the dialysis smaller and smaller. But this one is still very huge. Uh. It's like a very big box size, okay? And it was until 1960, someone uh, very brilliant came up with the idea of doing what we call Schreibner shunt, okay? I think some, some may heard about this before. It basically essentially means that if you create a small device with a wooden stick with uh, some tubes, can, imp can implant uh, superficially over the arm to create like a access for return and also the, the access so that actually the patient can go for dialysis easier, okay? And lo and behold, at that year, his patient take shields, become the first hemodiasis patient who actually survived 11 years. That was the miracle at that time. Because those times, if you can survive one or two sessions of dialysis without dying from all the reaction, uh, all the reaction from the materials, all the sepsis, because of very not sterile apparatus, it will be a wonder. But imagine this kind of patient, this patient actually survived 11 years of dialysis. And that actually brings out a lot of improvement and, and modification to the machine until Richard Stewart actually invented a very small hollow fiber dialyzer, which is most likely almost same size, but generally still bigger than our current dialysis uh, filter. This is just filter, you know, you can see that this filter and the first filter that they created is so huge in difference. And it was until 19, uh, 1966 that uh, these three people actually created the AV fistula. So you can see the mouse one is hemodialysis is quite remarkable, right? Because you can see that a lot of things that we used to take for granted at this day and age, it will be so difficult and not achievable at those at those era, you see? So again, the reason I brought up this issue is because so that you can understand a bit more on hemodialysis. So back to the concept of hemodialysis, very simple thing. I try to make things very simple, just photo and few words. So when we talk about hemodialysis, you must have an assess port, so-called the assess and the return, okay? either through an AV fistula or through a catheter. And the access is a red, remember? Blood pumps out, it's red. And if, when, essentially, we'll go through a pump to make sure that it can pump into the system. And you we'll add on some anticoagulation, followed by entering a filter. You can see that this blood is actually flowing in an anticlockwise position. And this flow rate is what we call as QB, right? It's a blood flow, okay? And at the same time, there is a dialysate fluid that flows counter current mechanism just like how our kidney function at a different direction clockwise and this is what we call as QD okay and subsequently the blood after pass through the dialyzer will go back to the system through the return okay which is the blue label as blue so this is a forms a basic circuit of hemodialysis regardless how complicated it becomes it essentially it just means this this setup okay when you talk about hemodialysis you're talking about the mode the access 
the dialyzer, the dialysis, and decoagulation, I won't talk about it because it's very technical. But mainly, I'm just going to focus on mode and access. When we talk about mode of dialysis, we all know that if you want to extract the fluid, we just need to extract the fluid, right? That's what we call a sustained ultrafiltration. Certain centers call intermittent UF or sustained ultrafiltration. Okay. So SU or IUF is actually mean you are only applying UF as the one of the mechanism. Okay. You just extract the water, the diffusion, the convection, all those things is not of your concern. You're not, you're, you're, you're just going to, someone actually used a very interesting uh, concept to remember dialysis. They say that dialysis is essentially just like a washing machine. You either wash or you dry. Okay, in SU, this situation, you are drying out the patient. Okay, you are just using drying concept, which is the ultra filtration. When you talk about hemodialysis, you are actually wash and dry at the same time. So you can decide to wash the patient, or you can just put UF new, it's also possible, no need to wash. But you have option to wash and also dry. Uh, wash as in passive diffusion and dry is the ultra filtration. So you're using two principles out of four. Hemofiltration is a new is a term that refers to convection. If you are using convection principle, then you are essentially doing hemofiltration. So hemofiltration uses a concept of convection, okay, by having a replacement fluid pop up to the blood to push out uh, more substance to remove more middle molecule. Okay. And on top of that, you can also have ultra filtration. And the more common words that we always hear is actually HDF, okay? Hemodifiltration, meaning we combine dialysis and filtration. Therefore, we get these three, ultrafiltration, passive diffusion, and convection, okay? Bear in mind that all these modality can have ultrafiltration, depends on your indication, whether you want to put UF new or UF how many liters, depending on the hours of dialysis. And uh, all these modes also can have different degree of adjunction. That will depend on the types of the filters, high flux, low flux, or even some special filter. Okay. So next we talk about assess. Assess is mainly we are talking about fistula or catheter, right? When we talk about AV fistula, we have to talk about selection, maturation, and care. Selection, what we are talking about is actually it's always preferable to, to actually select a patient non-dominant arm as the as the arm to become a fistula as compared to the dominant arm, okay? And the order of preference is always from the distal to more proximal, the RCF, the BCF, and BBS is something very uh, a bit more challenging. That's why it's not the preferred as compared to BCF, okay? And when your fistula already exhausted, not very good, flow has got some issue, for example, uh, let's say thrombose, for example, let's say got some pseudo aneurysm, then rupture, then repair, the, the fistula coya already. So perhaps you have to diverge it, you have to put some graph, what we call as AV graph. You can just you can see that it can get more and more complicated. Okay. And it's also important for us to know some concept of maturation and care. Okay. Next thing is the catheter. Catheter, we know that's either non calf or calf. Non calf is generally uh, ideally is supposed to use for short term. Calf is usually we put that because poor vascular uh, access, we put it for more longer term, especially uh, those patients that has uh, central venous occlusion, those patients that have can a lot of thrombosis, okay? And they generally may have a, a very poor outcome when it comes to when the catheter gets blocked or infected like CRBSI. And we talk about order of preference. Uh, order of preference for this is actually more in relation to acute dialysis, not for you know uh, long term RRT or CKT. So for preference, it's always better to put the right IJV as the first option and femoral as the second option, followed by the left internal jug. The reason why left internal jugular may not be as good as the femoral vein is because sometimes you may have some anatomical variation and sometimes your catheter tip may not be really uh, uh, positioned well as you put in. So it may not be actually preferred, but it is debatable. Not necessarily femoral vein is actually better than left IJ. It depends on the condition, patient, uh, patient anatomy as well. And perhaps the last, last, last thing that we want to do is to put in subclavian, in which the higher risk of complication because it cannot be compressed. Let's say you injured the subclavian artery, that, that space, below the clavicle cannot be compressed. It's very dangerous, okay? So try not to do, okay? So how about when you are exhausted? All the vascular access are exhausted, okay? You all can read about this article, very interesting. Usually, in the, depending on the center, that you, whether you have a good 
vascular surgeon, you have a good uh, international radiologist, you will don't have any those uh, advanced facility you can refer. But let's say patient is too ill to be referred or too ill for any uh, intervention, you may really want to decide what is the outcome, whether you want to decide for palliation instead of you know doing more harms than benefit. Let's say patient really, really uh, have a very poor support and crash landed many, many times and still refuse dialysis, or even if let's say already uh, dialysis for many years, and then every dialysis also got issues, and then not a suitable candidate to go for cradle dialysis or even transplant. So all this kind of discussion need to really talk with the patient. But let's say before we talk about palliation, I think we should consider more advancement in terms of the access. There's something called a hero graph, okay? It, it's basically uh, more option to create graph from here and there, just to bypass, okay? The, the idea is just to essentially get into the big vessel, whether it's a vein or artery, and to be able to achieve a good flow so that you can dialyze the patient. You can see there's certain things that is very advanced. I think in Malaysia, it's also very difficult to practice. But some of the things are like transhepatic catheter is something that are uh, practiced in certain tertiary center. For example, HKL also in UM as well. So sometimes we have really exhausted the access. We have no other choice. And perhaps we should really go in with the risk of uh, doing this transhepatic catheter, okay? But I believe that when the international nephrologist uh, 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 program is more developed and more people are able to do more stuff, then perhaps the future for vascular access can, can be improved further, okay? So when we talk about maturation, maturation of uh, AV fistula, everyone knows, right, the rule of six, okay? It's, it's all written in the uh, KRT guideline. But what is the meaning of rule of six? Okay, essentially, it's very important, and that that this rule of six is something that the vascular uh, team you should use to assess whether the fistula is mature enough to 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 be needled. Okay, and usually the first needling should be by the most senior uh, MA as well as the using a plastic uh, needle. Okay, to avoid injury. Okay, so when you talk about rule of six, essentially you're talking about uh, five things. Okay. Fistula diameter should be thick, I mean, at least about 6 mm, and the depth actually should be thin, very superficial, close to the skin surface, less than 6 mm. And the segment, at least, you because you cannot get, you cannot put the excess and return needle too close to each other, what that will cause is actually what we call recirculation, meaning to say the blood just circulate from, from the excess to the vein without going into the system. This recirculation can actually lead to uh, under dialysis, okay, reduce in the KT over V ratio, reduce in the efficacy of the dialysis. So that's why we don't want recirculation if possible. Ideally, there shouldn't be recirculation, but there's something unavoidable. That's why at least six centimeter apart, okay, for fistula kneeling must be long enough, okay, and the flow of the fistula must be fast, okay. The fistula flow should actually go up to six hundred mils per minute. Although in real life, we're we definitely not giving, uh, not dialyzing the patient with this kind of QB. But this is something that the fistula criteria in order for us to be start using. And perhaps the duration is six to eight weeks. This depends. The earliest that you can use the fistula by that is six weeks. But that depends on the maturation as well as the, the comfortability for vascular uh, team to give the access. Some to give the clearance to do a dialysis. Sometimes the fistula, everything criteria is fulfilled, but but it looks still small in a way, and there is some uh, difficulty during their fistula creation. And some, they may actually give a longer duration. But generally, we let the vascular team decide whether we can needle the fistula or not, okay? So when we talk about ABF care, we are talking about a few simple, but I would say important thing. First is to prevent standard precaution of hygiene. You don't want to get infected and monitor for sign of bleeding or infection, avoid direct trauma, avoid applying BP cuff. That's, I think everyone knows and avoid any restrictive form of clothing over the fistula arm and avoid carrying any object, heavy object using the fistula arm side, okay? And we also, we should always counsel the patient not to sleep <clears throat> uh, on the fistula arm as well because that will actually lead to uh, a lot of complication, okay? <clears throat> Next, we're talking about peritoneal dialysis. So as opposed to uh, hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis is a more, uh, I would say, uh, have more patient empowerment because patient can do by themselves. And you can do at home, they can do even do when they're sleeping. There's a lot of types of peritoneal dialysis in which is not the topic of today. It can be like NIC, uh, <clears throat> uh, the commonest being CAPD, can be CCPD, can be NIPD. There's a lot of mode, okay? But regardless which mode, the essential concept is still the same, using a peritoneum as a semi-permeable membrane. 
Peritoneum actually gives about surface area of one to two meters square per, per total body surface area. That is actually good enough to become a, a dialysis filter. Our dialysis filters usually also range about that, but generally almost about 1.5, 1.8, 2 point something. Okay. So you can see that <clears throat> for peritoneal dialysis, it, it involves putting in a catheter, which is permanent catheter, unless you're talking about step PD, the acute dialysis. Uh, but generally is making uh, is to is to make a permanent uh, tank of catheter and then you connect to the Y system and you are actually having a solution bag when you uh, make sure that the solution bag goes in one way system to the peritoneum and then let it let it uh, equilibrize all the electrolyte everything through the peritoneum as a filter <clears throat> and then followed by draining it out into a drainage bag this is essentially a simple concept so when you talk about peritoneal dialysis, you're talking about fill we are talking about dwell and we are talking about drain okay these three very simple words it, re it reflects the concept of predator analysis okay so just a bit of history on predator analysis we know that the, the hd looks like very eventful right how about predator analysis so predator analysis is something i would say also interesting because initially it started with uh 1744 in which uh, this stephen hills and christopher actually they try to remove a uh, ascites, a lady with ascites with some, you know, some sophisticated leather tube at those times. And they actually give, they actually give uh, uh, fifty percent of the water and another fifty percent of the wine. There's some typo here to clean, to clean the the abdomen. And then follow, they just they just poke in the tube and then they remove the fluid. So this concept of actually draining out the fluid came came about in back in 1744. It was until six uh 18. 62 that Frederick Daniel actually described the peritoneum uh, different composition inside the peritoneum and you can see that uh, this is not very important but basically in 1894 Ernest Henry Starling you know he's the one that you know have the Starling law and the Alfred Herbert actually discovered the peritoneal fluid removal is actually affected by the blood vessel the amount of the blood vessel in the peritoneum will actually influence the the, the fluid removal it was until uh, 1923 that this George Genter actually performed the first peritoneal dialysis with 1.5% of uh, 1.5 liter of normal saline, which is 0.9%. But unfortunately, the patients will come. Okay, so this is like you know the first person that underwent the dialysis, be it the hemo or peritoneal dialysis, the outcome is not good. They eventually still die. How about in 1952, Otto Grohmann actually used a very flexible uh, tube catheter with a small hole with a, at the tip instead of just a stiff tube. So it actually used a flexible tube and the tip of the tube is still just one one ended hole it make a lot of small small hole okay make it more effective it was until the uh 1962 that fred boyan actually introduced the concept of automate uh automated pd okay and back in 1968 henry tankoff is the famous guy who invented the permanent catheter and this tankoff is used nowadays the concept is still the same okay it's very pretty much similar to the uh, Tankov catheter nowadays that it has two cuff. The idea of Tankov catheter is actually having two cuff. I will show you the photo later. Basically, you have one uh, superficial or we call it subcutaneous cuff, and another one is a deep cuff. This is actually to prevent exit site infection and 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 the adhesion and and to promote the adhesion at the level of the peri uh, peritoneal uh, uh, muscle. Okay, so 1975, Robert Popovich and also Jack Monshif actually introduced. CAPD. So it was until then, no one actually do regular, uh, you know, peritoneal analysis until this these two person introduced this, and subsequently, uh, Dimitrios actually introduced the PD solution as a disposable plastic bag than glass container. So even before, uh, 1975, when these two person, uh, introduced the concept of CAPD, they are all dialyzed through the glass tube like that. You know, imagine your the dialysis bag is not bag, it's a tube, it's a glass tube very very high rate of peritonitis at those day at the same time the tube uh, i mean the 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 catheter that was putting in also has very high risk of infection so you can see that there's the evolution so this dimensions really have done a lot of improvement by changing the glass container into a disposable bag okay it was until 1980s that Bassetto actually start to introduce double bag system double bag system meaning to say that is uh uh there is two different content in the in the peritoneal Back, okay one is more like electrolyte and the one is just pure water because the, the study has shown that 
there is something called bioincompatibility when we use some artificial solution. When we mix the water together with this uh, electrolytes all together at, at almost near uh, human plasma composition, it can trigger a lot of this, uh, uh, what we call as uh, radicals. And when this, this uh, artificial fluid enters, mixed together for very long and, and enters the, the peritoneum, it actually can irritate the peritoneal membrane and that can actually reduce the, the efficacy of the peritoneal dialysis. Okay, so it was until 1996 that Ampanto again played a very important role. He actually invited the Y system. Okay, the Y system that you all see just now in the photo is actually invented by him. Before that, it's actually dialysis. I mean, for peritoneal dialysis, for the back, solution back and drainage back can mix together. Okay. They can actually go to and fro in a one way, uh, two way traffic instead of one way. So that actually predisposed to a lot of uh, translocation of bacteria from the drainage bag, go back, and then go up solution bag. So it's very messy in, at those days. And this person actually created the Y system. And therefore, actually, he reduced a lot of peritonitis uh, weight. So this is a tank of uh, illustration. Okay, so tango is basically they have two cuffs. One is at the subcutaneous level, one is actually at the abdominal wall. Uh, before the parietal peritoneal level, okay? So you can see that these two cuffs is very important because it actually makes the catheter uh, firmly situated by inducing a lot of local fibrosis. And that local fibrosis causes adhesion and prevent translocation of any outside normal uh, bacteria or organism to enter, okay? So that's why this is a uh, tank cough principle still very, still applied and still used in uh, peritoneal dialysis, very effective uh, measure, okay? So peritoneal dialysis, perhaps I will just stop there. I won't, go, I won't go into detail. Next, I will talk about uh, continuous kidney replacement therapy. This is perhaps a bit more advanced for a lot of people, if especially if you have never uh, or seldom in touch with a lot of this uh, critical care uh, kind of nephrology kind of field or even in ICU setting. Some of you might know a bit, but those people that know probably is also good for us to revise. And those that is very new to this concept, perhaps you all can, we all can learn together. So essentially, it's the same setup like a hemodialysis. But what happened is that it's a continuous, it's not like intermittent, like our hemodialysis, like, you know, even slack also like six hours, right? Hemodialysis is about usually two to four hours, depending on whether patient is naive to dialysis or not, whether can uh, can actually uh, uh, sustain and also have remain hemodialysis stable throughout the dialysis period. For continuous hemo, uh, kidney replacement therapy, actually is a very gentle form of dialysis. It actually should continue Guideline says that actually you should continue as long as you can, but generally every 72 hours, you need to change your filter. Like, cannot be too long. The filter will not be functioning very well. So generally speaking, CKRT generally, the longest period you can you can actually last is almost about three days, like, not longer than that. Or else you have to restart the whole circuit again. Okay, but it generally involves, again, assess the red one, go into the blood pump with the anticoagulation giving to prevent blood clot, and then go into the filter depending on very different types of filter. And then this is the one that makes it different, okay? Once the those uh, toxin or those uh, electrolytes that is un un uh, unneeded will be filtered out from the filter, go into that the effluent bag, and it will go uh, into this effluent, okay? Meanwhile, uh, okay, sorry, this is the this is actually effluent as in this is a replacement for it. So sometimes, sometimes, uh, when you want to do convection, you need to push get that that push kind of fluid. Uh, to, to provide that pressure, right? So this is actually what we call replacement fluid. Replacement fluid is actually a way that they will put replacement fluid, they will pass through the pressure filter uh, to give some pressure, and then you will go into the filter and then at the same time intersect between the blood flow and that will give the transmembrane pressure. That will push out all the middle molecules, especially those cytokine, those endotoxins, okay? So those are the, this is actually replacement fluid. And those unwanted filter that, uh, unwanted uh, that, dialysate that will be removed into the dialysate system, okay? And generally for CKRT, it's different than hemodialysis or different than parietal dialysis. When we talk about clearance, when we talk about effectiveness or efficacy of dialysis, in hemodialysis, the efficacy of dialysis is, is decided by the KT over B ratio. And that actually, we use urea as a single um, measure to actually measure the, the efficacy of removal of the, of the solute, okay? For peritoneal dialysis, again, we can also use KT over V, okay? But for CKRT, 
how we know the doses of dialysis is good, we actually actually we actually target this efferent flow, which is the removal of the waste. And that will include the UF as well at the equation. Okay. But just remember that the the efficacy of the uh, mode of dialysis is actually different for CKRT. It actually uses the removal of the waste, okay, which include the UF. So that will be the effluent flow and the dose that is going to be prescribed. So CKRT again says that hemodialysis can only remove water soluble waste. And there's no rapid shift in fluid, therefore, it actually has a very good hemodynamic stability. Gentle, very, very gentle form, and actually is in temperature control. In fact, a lot of patients, once started off on CKRT, will go into hypothermia without giving, you know, without giving a, a, a warm form of uh, replacement fluid. Sometimes you have to control temperature very well. And actually, those septic patients have high grade fever. This actually really gives them a cooling effect. It will give a very good temperature control. And it can also gently correct all the electrolyte imbalance as well as the renal function. And those extreme like severe hyponatremia, like sodium, we are talking about, you know, 101 or even like, like 105, like, but the urea is very high, creatine is very high. You cannot dialyze the patient using a conventional dialyzer because our usual dialyzer is 120, okay? Uh, if you go lower than that, you have to use CKRT to adjust individual electrolytes. So that is the tricky part. So certain, certainly CKRT is like, it's like a master for all the dialysis, okay? It is like the ultimate system that you can put the patient on for a for safest uh, outcome and the best outcome. And the last part is perhaps why it gives a space for nutritional support is because it can remove any fluids that you want, meaning to say you can adjust your UF easily, you can adjust your replacement fluid easily, and therefore you won't overload the patient easily, even if you give things like, for example, TPN, even you want to load the patient with some fluids or even like, like colloids or anything, you will not able to uh, overload the patient. It's a very, uh, very ideal and also very, very good machine. Okay. So ideally, it, it should be done with in ICU setting or even in a CCU or HDU setting. And generally, there's two types. And generally, I think for KKN setting or even in UST hospital, it's usually using the Prisma Fax machine, the green one, like a robot, you know, with a height of almost same length as, uh, same height as us. And there's also another machine that we seldom use, okay? Certain centers, they may practice that, but I will not go into detail for that. So when we talk about CKRT, it's not Chakotiao, Chakotiao, because there's an R there, eh? CKRT. When we talk about uh, CKRT, there's different modes, okay? It's same principle as what we have discussed. When we talk about H per se, it's the hemofiltration. If you do hemofiltration alone, you will have a free replacement or post replacement fluid, okay? To push the the middle molecule clearance, okay? And the post replacement fluid also uh, can actually helps, okay? To really give additional benefit, okay? For example, there is difference to give either pre or post replacement fluid, but generally this is not the point of discussion because it can get very technical. But just remember that in, in field hemofiltration, you can actually, you are actually giving replacement fluid and then mix with the blood and go into the filter. And then the, the, the waste will be removed with the effluent, okay? In the effluent bag. Okay, as opposed to HD, which is essentially you are giving a dialysate, entering the filter, and then the dialysate and the effluent will actually go together. Okay, this is like the, what the, the advanced mode of hemodialysis, essentially the same without a replacement fluid. If you do CVV HDF, then you are actually giving replacement fluid together with dialysate as well as uh, the UF of the patient, and all these three will be factored in as the effluent. Okay, so this is CVV HDF. And therefore, and also we have SLED. SLED is something like a gentle form of uh, sustained low efficacy uh, ultra uh, dialysis. It essentially, it's the same setup as this, but it's a low, uh, a higher setting than the CVV HDF. SCARF is basically uh, just extract uh, water, which is UF, uh, sustained uh, uh, continuous ultra filtration. It's just same as intermittent UF, but SCARF you can actually go for like quite long. You can go for a few hours. Okay, so. Now, uh, perhaps I want to introduce a uh, fourth or fifth more important concept, why we need to use uh, CVVHDF or CKRT in a very ill patient, like septic patient, okay? We have to understand the concept of SIRS and also CARS. I think everyone knows why SIRS is a systemic inflammation that triggers a lot of cytokine storm, causing multi-organ failure, dysfunction, and subsequently carry high mortality. But there's also a very interesting concept called CARS. 
whenever there is an info, uh, inflammatory mediators, pro-inflammatory mediators, there is also anti-inflammatory mediators try to suppress this Im immune response. This is what we call as compensatory anti-inflammatory response syndrome. So TARS actually works try to compensate the cells. So in a way, uh, this is actually proven in various articles based on cytokine study because certain cytokines trigger cells, certain cytokines trigger TARS. So they found that in a very severe sepsis patient, different uh, cytokines will increase at the different level and at a different amount. And this actually gives to this concept way back to 2003. Surprise, right? Those, those of you that don't know about this concept, you'll be surprised that almost 20 years from now, this is something that you just heard. But this is not something new. It's already been there, especially in the intensive care setting. Uh, I believe all anesthesiologists will definitely know about this. But generally, it's not too late for us to know. SIRS will actually, actually mount our immune response. But what happened in 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 class is that other than suppressing the cells which is suppressing all the pro inflammatory mediators it will actually induce the body to become immunosuppressed that's the reason why you and i don't get you know cre or don't get uh, don't get any form of bugs easily in icu or intensive care but yet patient easily can get a lot of hospital acquired infection like like you know the, the ns team has been working there for like how many years and why the patient just admitted like three or four days suddenly got you know got a lot of hospital acquired infection already it's actually because all these things are going on in which the cars try to suppress the immune system at the same time also suppress the own body healthy uh, immune defense mechanism that actually predisposed to infection okay and if the patient can survive from the cars patient will achieve recovery otherwise patient will eventually die okay so this is the concept way back in 2003 while back in 2015 uh they have more uh data to show that actually this uh, two mechanism is not all because these two mechanism does not occur like a phase like cells followed by cars it actually occur almost immediately and it will usually i mean the cars usually will lag behind a few a few a few uh, hours to days but generally it's not too long and they, they found that actually this is the olden concept in which like what we mentioned just now cells triggered cars okay cells first then cars right then patient will die for a lot of things huh but the newer concept which is the more appropriate concept is actually cells and cars is actually triggered at the same time because it's like a tai chi huh? like a tai chi yin and yang when the yin is activated yang must compensate right so it's like a body will try to achieve what we call as immune hemostasis in order to prevent uh, further uh, inflammatory cytokine storm all those things to, to actually uh, harm the body so but at the same time all these things depending on which one wins it let's say cars wins and manage to tune down the immune response and cars can 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 shut out by itself then usually no problem but what happened is that they can actually also progress and persist and this condition is what we call as peace okay peaks persistent inflammatory immunosuppression and catabolism syndrome patient will become you know negative nitrogen balance patient will become very hecastic later on admitted to the icu uh, all the protein losing enteropathy everything set in everything loose already the body is uh, very weak because of all these things going on so this is actually a more accurate presentation on what happens in our immune system when we when we get a severe sepsis and eventually if we cannot we cannot uh override this mechanism be it the pro-inflammatory cytokine or anti-inflammatory uh, anti cytokine we will eventually succumb, as you can see. So that's a very important concept when we talk about critical care setting. So different cytokine, different cytokine actually mediates different things. For pro-inflammatory cytokine, actually mainly it's a TNA alpha and also interleukin-6. The rest of it, they helps to activate together. And for anti-inflammatory cytokine, it's mainly triggered by interleukin-10 and TGF beta. Okay, so you can see that when we measure the molecule size of all these cytokines, you can see that your interleukin 10 is here ranging about, you know, about 11 kilodalton. Your TGF beta, your interleukin 6 is about 20 to 30 range, right? So all these things, uh, interleukin 8 is very small, can be removed. But all these molecules are belongs to middle molecule, right? We talk about middle molecule for 5 to 15 itself is already middle molecule. So if you use a normal dialysis, hemodialysis, definitely all those things will not be removed our conventional that hemodialysis cannot remove middle molecule and therefore it's important to apply hemofiltration and you cannot just give hemofiltration because at the same time you want to remove all the other toxin all the small water soluble molecule so that's that comes the concept of hemodifiltration which is the hdf and 
how to apply convection and absorption that will depend on the setting convection meaning to say you are giving hemofiltration diffusion meaning you are giving hemodialysis and therefore hemodifiltration and what contributes the absorption is actually the types of the filter okay you can see the albumin stands alone like number one in the in the in the chart here because we cannot we should not remove albumin right once we remove albumin die no nothing nothing will remain in the in the plasma everything will be removed okay so you can see that middle molecule clearance plays a very important role in severe sepsis okay so let's say if we manage to intervene early we use CVHDF to start early here when the cells and the cars is triggering before causing pulse peaks okay so patient will achieve small curve here patient will achieve early recovery and we achieve recovery in the immune hemostasis and patient can be discharged well. You can see this curve. But let's say if you start the, the CVHDF late, when the immune response is already very significant, causing cytokine storm, multi-organ failure, and your and body also at the same time mount similar amount of cars to, to counteract this cytokine storm, eventually you can see patient can, regardless going which direction, patient will eventually die. Okay, it's either die from fulminant uh, septic uh, sepsis or you die from immunoparesis. Okay, immunoparesis causing a lot of hospital inquiry infection in which patient cannot recover from it. Okay, you can see this is actually important concept to understand why it's important when we start CVHDF in a critical care setting. Okay, so how do we optimize the CKRT in sepsis? Okay, so we have discussed definitely no doubt we should use the CVHDF instead of, you know, like either hemofiltration alone or hemodialysis alone, okay? And what is the dose prescribed? This dose is actually based on the effluent uh, flow rate, which is the dose in CKRT, okay? So this dose, uh, they have very study multiple literature. Some, uh, the first study actually shows that high dose is better than low dose. Subsequent RCT shows that uh, low dose, high dose, no difference. And generally, up to this date, KDGO actually recommend us to give 30 to 35, okay, meals per kg per hour. And that the reason is being, the prescribed dose is most often not the actual, uh, not the actual dose that was delivered to the patient because of a lot of long circuit issue, the filter, you know, sometimes the dialysis machine will, will, will stop and the nurse need to change the bag, or the effluent bag. And then sometimes the, the filter can clog a bit, the pressure is very high, this, this kings, that kings. So a lot of times we are not able to give our full prescribed dose. And therefore we should aim a bit higher, about 20% 20, 20 higher. Therefore it's about, you know, we ideally we should aim about 20 to 25, the, 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 the delivered dose, but we should aim a bit higher to, to actually uh, take into account on all those issues. And when we talk about filter, it's an important concept. To optimize the CKRT in sepsis, other than choosing a good dose, a good mode, the next thing is a filter. There's different types of filter that can actually uh, uh, actually try to remove all more cytokine or even endotoxin from the body. So the first is actually if you're able to use a high flux filter. I have mentioned just now, if you flux is actually a measure of the size of the pore. If the pore is larger, then definitely more stuff can pass through, right? But you don't want to be too large until the albumin also come out, right? well, then there's no point to do dialysis. So, but those high flux or mid middle to high flux filter, like for example, PITS filter, is actually like HF 1000, it may not have available in most of the center other than ICU, can actually uh, give space to remove the middle molecules, okay? Up to 10 to 15 kilodalton. We know that our conventional dialysis can perhaps remove up to 10 kilodalton. That will be the maximum limit. Okay. So this one can give additional benefit to remove up to 15. But if let's say uh, we use a better filter in which other than having a lot of large pores, we don't do uh, like we, we don't make the filter to be large pores all the time. We make some small, some large. Okay. This is what we call a high cut off. Okay, high cutoff filter. So the configuration of the filter, instead of just having large pores or small pores, it can have you know mixture of both, and that can actually those large pores one can selectively remove those larger uh, middle molecule or even large molecule. So it can actually allow space to remove those molecule like up to sixty kilodalton. You can see they're very good, right? And but when we talk about sepsis, when we talk about removing cytokine as well as uh, endotoxin absorption play a very important role okay the problem with absorption is that a filter when more and more uh, stuff get clogged at the membrane surface of the filter that will affect the efficacy of the filter okay and therefore the filter should not be uh, continued for very long like more than three days 
or 72 hours. But you can see that different different uh, filter actually have different absorption capacity. So usually the more com most common filter, if you go to ICU, you ask the NS team, the most common thing that they usually have is the M100 as well as Oxilis. Okay, M100 and Oxilis is uh, uh, it's like a commonly available kind of filter that can help in terms of uh, removing the cytokine as well as removing a lot of toxin. But please, please don't be bored by the details. It's also very good uh, for us to understand just the basic of it instead of knowing all the, you know, the, 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 the very high fine name or even some model. But basically, there's a few filter, like for example, cytosol. Cytosol means to absorb cytokine. Absorb, you can see like it's not, it's not purposely spelled wrong. It's absorb cytokine and then will mean up to 60. Almost same as a high cut off membrane, okay. But the problem with cytosol is actually it cannot absorb uh, endotoxin because it don't have any specific membrane to do that. And subsequently, the study came out. Uh, more people invented a new form of you know all, all these are synthetic material, the different form of chemicals like polymethyl methyl acrylate, which can actually absorb cytokine as well as a protein. But the problem is that it's very high risk to actually cause. Uh, filter clotting not very effective okay and therefore comes this an69 okay a lot of people may ask why an69 is like is it some brand model got an70 an72 or not the answer is no there's only an69 why is it because an stands for acryl acryl nitrile which is the chemical and 69 is actually this this filter is actually being introduced in 1969 that's why it's called an69 okay then the common uh, filter that we use is actually M100. You will see that all patients that were started on CKRT, CVVHDF, will use M100 by default. Usually, we use M100. Okay, and it actually contains certain things as compared to normal filter. It contains this uh, sodium metal sulfonate material, in which actually it can it's a very negative charge membrane. It can traps water molecule, and that forms like a hydrogel membrane, and that can actually absorb cytokine. But the problem with this membrane classically is it happens more in pediatric, not in adult. Some patient, if you start the patient on M100, the patient may go into hypotension, that's certainly tachycardia, like, like some form of allergic reaction like that. It's what we call as bradycardia release syndrome. And that can be reduced if you prime the patient with a saline prime instead of prime the patient with the patient blood. Okay, Meaning to say you prime the patient with uh, saline or the replacement free with the, with the dialysate first. So, Basically, in CVVHDF, the dialysate, the replacement fluid, the effluent, all the back composition is the, exactly the same. Okay, But you're actually priming with those saline or, or those composition first before you start the patient on CVVHDF. You shouldn't prime the patient with the blood because that will trigger the allergic reaction, which what we call as bradycardia release syndrome. Okay, So what happened is after AN69 is introduced, it's very useful. Subsequently, uh, they want to make it better. Okay, so what they do is they treat the surface of AN69 with certain things, like for example, what it calls PEI, polyethyl, polyethylene imine. Okay, and this surface treated polyethylene imine is very good because it's positively charged, and it can very good to absorb endotoxin instead. We know that this uh metal sulfonate membrane can actually absorb a lot of cytokine, but this surface treated PEI material can actually absorb endotoxin because of this positively charged uh membrane, and also correct the, the disadvantage of using the conventional AN69, less risk of body kidney syndrome. And also because heparin, if you use uh, anticoagulation, it can also be trapped on the surface of this PEI and therefore have less risk of thrombogenicity, okay? Because it will trap and then you will make the membrane uh, less risk of clotting. And the best uh, filter is perhaps what we call as oxalis, okay? Oxalis uh, uh, is a very new uh, filter it's very good because it's basically it's an enhanced form of AN69 surface treated material, but they, they added a heparin graph. You can see that this AN69, if you don't prime with heparin, you are giving like HEP-free, no anticoagulation, then this, this membrane definitely can get clotted as well. But Oscillus by default already got heparin graph inside the filter, and that reduces the thrombogenicity. At the same time, because he inherited the AN69 material, uh, property as well as the surface treated property. AN69 contains again sulfonate uh, material that actually absorbs cytokine and surface treated with PEI can absorb endotoxin. So it can actually absorb both endotoxin and cytokine. You can see, although it looks very complicated, right? But when you try to understand the, the reasoning and the rationale behind this filter, then you realize that actually it's not difficult to understand. It's just the concept that, that really matters, right? So this is the Oxalis, okay? Oxalis, I'm not promoting a product, just, just basically introducing the concept. 
you got like first layer got this AN69. We know that AN69 contains the beta sulfonyl uh, membrane, which is actually good to uh, absorb cytokine. And the second layer, because of this PEI material, treated surface material, it can absorb endotoxin. And the heparin graph will reduce the thrombogenicity, like what we mentioned. Okay. So this brings to the uh, perhaps the sixth uh, learning post for tonight is that other than continuous uh, kidney replacement therapy, there's also non-kidney non uh, non indication of doing a dialysis. What, we, what is the non-kidney indication of doing dialysis? We have go through like severe sepsis is one of them, and then what is the acute liver failure? So we need to know what is the reasoning, like what I mentioned, to do a uh, uh, continuous kidney replacement therapy. We need to understand this picture, this concept, when the first uh, albumin dialysis is being introduced. I, actually, if you realize, eventually the concept is not difficult. And actually, if you uh, go through all this, all this important fundamental knowledge, then you realize that oh, essentially they are all the same and just modify here and there using a different concept. Okay, so this is actually very important photo to me to un to illustrate that actually what is albumin bound solute and what is water soluble solute. Okay, you can see I am going to highlight just to focus on those important things. In acute liver failure, uh, albumin, uh, albumin definitely. Uh, I mean you will not be removed. Albumin is the synthetic markers. But those things like uh, albumin can bind to is important thing for us to remove. Like for example, bilirubin, we want to remove that. Uh, bile acid, you want to remove that. Nitric oxide also, we want to remove that. And water-soluble wise, uh, ammonia, we want to remove that. And some other uh, urea, creatinine, all those things like what we discussed earlier. But you can see that generally, uh, CKRT, using a CVV HDF, even with the best option also, you can remove only the water-soluble substance. The albumin bound substance is very difficult to remove, okay? And that comes to the question of how are we going to deal with this? How are we going to remove the albumin bound substance, okay? For now, we are talking about uh, absorption. Absorption is perhaps something that you can use to remove, but generally they are very small. Bilirubin is really, really small, less than, you know, it's, it's definitely less than five kilo delta. So it's difficult to remove all this kind of albumin bound substance and yet they are very small. So how do we do that? So here comes the concept of albumin dialysis. Okay. Albumin dialysis, when it first started, actually has a few things in picture we are going to go through later on. But please bear in mind for me just to discuss on this very simple uh, colorful diagram. When the liver go into a state of failure, what happens is that liver will actually secrete it's something similar to SIRS and, and PAS kind of concept. Liver is a very immunogenic organ, and liver is the only organ that can actually regenerate. If you if you if you counsel for patient for liver transplant before, one of the things that we tend to counsel the donor is that once your kidney is being uh, once your kidney blood, once once your liver is being donated, uh being transplanted to the recipient, we will monitor you and subsequently your, your liver actually may actually regrow back to the normal size. So Liver is perhaps the one of the organ that is very, very peculiar. It can regrow, it can regenerate by itself, and it can potentially get well by itself. But what happened in acute liver failure is that at this point of time, the kidney has shut down. But when kidney shut down in terms of the function, it will simulate a lot of uh, cytokine. And this cytokine is what we call as damage associated membrane proteins or molecular proteins. And those can actually activate your macrophage and and cause further uh, pro-inflammatory cytokine activation and that can cause SIRS. At the same time, let's say there is any other triggered, like for example, sepsis, any bacteria, it can trigger another things as what we call as, uh, what we call as, uh, instead of damage associated molecular proteins, it's called pathogen associated molecular proteins, dam uh, DAMS and PAMS, okay? These two can trigger the cytokine storm and it will never end. But let's say if we got counter-inflammatory, same concept as what we mentioned, SIRS and also CAS, Liver also have a uh, counter inflammatory uh, mechanism in which if those mechanism gets activated and it can regenerate itself, the, the, the liver can actually potentially heal by itself. So what you need to do at this stage is, is actually essentially to remove all these pro-inflammatory cytokine as well as some you know, dams and also PAMs. And how you're going to remove that is actually through what we call as plasmapheresis or High volume plasma phylicis, or so same thing what you call a therapeutic plasma exchange. Okay, so all these things is considered what we call as extra artificial liver support system. Okay, so essentially we are talking about therapeutic plasma exchange. Okay, and nowadays you can see that actually TPE is actually more superior than human albumin dialysis, or we call it albumin dialysis. 
but be it a mask, SPAD, or Prometheus, these three is older form of technology, and they are generally together is the same, what we call as albumin dialysis, meaning to say they put albumin into the dialysate, and for the albumin in the dialysate to interact with the all the and uh, all the dams and pans uh, from the blood serum, and therefore those those things will actually bound unbound from the plasma uh, albumin and go to the dialysate albumin, and therefore those particles and molecules can get removed. Okay, but uh, what happened is that this this type of human uh, this type of albumin dialysis does not replace a patient albumin or plasma. Okay, because the albumin is very huge, it cannot go past the filter, meaning to say there's no connection in between dialysate and also the blood. Okay, so it means that they are actually very good in removing the toxin. Like, for example, they are very good in removing all the bilirubin, all the harmful dams and PEMs, but they are not good in terms of replacing the liver synthetic function. We are talking about like albumin, one of the markers. Okay, in which acute liver failure, the albumin cannot be produced, cannot be, you know, all the, all the, amino genesis and all those things is not being uh, uh, carried out so kidney uh, the the liver actually goes into a shutdown state and therefore all the synthetic substance including anticoagulants procoagulants and all those uh, uh, clotting factors are not being replenished they are very low and they are very coagulopathic so that's why therapeutic plasma exchange comes into play ppe other than doing other than removing removing the uh the the those dams and pams as well as the albumin bound toxin it can replace the synthetic function of the liver using either ffp or human albumin okay so that's the advantage of tpe over other form of albumin dialysis system so it's all this actually serve to replace and detox function but to, to replace the synthetic function is only tpe detoxification every every types also can de detoxify and Another good thing about this uh, liver support system is what we mentioned. Essentially, we want to remove the dams, the pathogenic antibodies, the pro inflammatory cytokine to give time for liver to produce more counter inflammatory uh, cytokine and therefore causes more liver regeneration and re uh, liver recovery. Okay, there's no way you can you can you can you know treat the liver acute liver failure by by giving some supplement or anything to to to, to really helps with the uh the liver itself the liver will have to recover by itself okay the thing that we give for example pcm uh overdose we are giving high dose nac is actually just to reduce the oxidative stress okay let's say the other thing like for example uh hep b flare or hep b we are giving like we have started we can you should have you also we start plasma exchange uh at the same time we also start the antiviral okay so those actually just to reduce the trigger only but eventually how the river come out from from failure become a a, a healthy liver is actually through its own regenerative capacity this is a very another important concept we are, have to support the liver to recover okay if we don't support early the liver may not recover okay and because of this support therapy is what we call as bridging therapy certain patients you want to support them before they are fit for uh, liver transplant so they are all a form of bridging therapy so they can use together with regional citrate reason why is a regional citrate anticoagulation it does not go into systemic circulation <clears throat> you can also give heparin because it's a short half-life and uh uk filler uh, especially those that uh deal with transplant uh, they tend to use more process cycling, but generally, I think our country never have experience with this. So this is again uh, important things that we we we, to, we have go through. You can see that this is a mass. This is a Prometheus. They are essentially the same, almost the same setup. They are actually uh, uh, basically there is there is actually a dialysis circuit together with albumin circuit. It's the same. So basically, mass and Prometheus are uh, is the name sounds very high fi right? Like from the foreign planet, right? But essentially, it means that you are using a dialysis machine and you add on with albumin circuit. That's all. There's nothing high fi about it. And how you add on is actually you add on one more filter. For example, mass, you are using mass filter, which contains albumin as well. It's a form of albumin filter. And the albumin, once you go through the albumin circuit, and then if you go past this charcoal also the to detoxify the remaining uh, some other dams or pans or anything and then you will go to NRN exchanger to to actually equalize the, the ions and then before going back to the patient you can see that it also go through the dialysis circuit Prometheus also the same thing just that the component is a bit different and they also using albumin uh, as a in inside the filter 
to actually remove all the albumin bound toxin. Okay, uh, single pass albumin dialysis is even easier. You can even do it like uh, using a normal dialysis machine. Essentially, you are just adding human albumin into the dialysate pack. Okay, once you do that, you are hoping that when the counter current flow mechanism occur, and this one must use a high flux filter, so that when the counter current mechanism go through, the 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 albumin bound toxin from the patient blood will go into the dialysate and bound there, and you will they will forever stick there, lah. So that is um, another method to remove. But you can see that be it the SPAD mask and also the Prometheus, they don't replace the synthetic function of the liver. But what replaces is actually the TPE. So TPE, they have, you're actually giving FFP or albumin into the patient. At the same time, you are removing the patient waste, which is the albumin bound toxin. So actually it serves to detoxify. At the same time, it also serves to provide synthetic function. That would be something very ideal. Huh? If we run something like this. Okay, so what is the complication for CKRT or the complication of TPE? Generally, they are essentially the same, okay? So complication, we are talking about vascular access, like what usual dialysis will happen, can cause bleeding, pneumothorax, depending on the expertise of insertion, can cause infection. And systemic can cause hypotension, uh, thrombocytopenia, hemolysis, especially when, you know, certain reaction to the membrane can actually cause uh, different degree of hemolysis. Okay, can also cause anaphylaxis reaction to the dialyzer or the membrane. And sometimes because of this uh, therapy, because of this high flux removal, we're talking about the pulse, the convection, you know, the mineral molecule removal, inevitably some antibiotics will ac actually get removed undeniably. So you may need to adjust a lot of medication, you may need to serve after the dialysis, or even you, must, you may need to change to antibiotic that is not easily removed. Okay, and Another thing is the electrolyte imbalance and acid base balance. We know that actually the thing about how the hypocalcemia and metabolic alkalosis can occur is because let's say you are giving a uh, therapeutic plasma exchange. This principle applies to all sort of uh, machine that you're using. Okay, let's say you're doing TPE for any indication. You're doing TPE for GBS, you're doing TPE for, for example, MG crisis, you're doing TPE for for example, uncle associated vasculitis. Okay, you essentially you are using either FFP or albumin. And FFP actually one pack of FFP actually contains about thirteen percent of citrate as a form of stabilizer to prevent the 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 FFP to clot. Okay, so actually one pack alone got thirteen percent. Imagine how many packs of FFP you are using for TPE. Actually a lot. Like one session you are usually use about twenty to thirty pack of FFP. Okay, so each pack already contains citrate. And what's more, let's say you want to transfuse the patient, every every pack cell also contains citrate as well. And what's more is that when you use uh, this kind of machine, most of the time you need to use some form of anticoagulation because CRT or also called CKRT or TPE are very expensive set out. One set can cost easily a few thousand. So you don't want the machine to clot and then you want to change the whole thing and then the cost is getting more and more expensive. So you want to maintain what we call a circuit life of the of the machine. So therefore, anticoagulation should ideally be given and you can use citrate as an anticoagulation. But we need to monitor because sometimes the citrate can escape into the, the system, into the blood, return to the patient blood. Usually, if the patient liver is, is not impaired, then liver can actually metabolize the citrate into bicarb. So that is not an issue. But what happens is that when the patient has acute liver failure, then the liver cannot metabolize the citrate. So what happens is citrate will continue bound to our, our calcium, especially the free calcium, and that actually causes uh, hypocalcemia. Patient can go into very severe hypocalcemia and get cardiac arrhythmia. You know, the, the ECG straight away prolonged QTC and the patient just, just asystole. It can happen. And because of this bicarb production and everything, patient can also have meta metabolic alkalosis. Lah, no? And how we detect citrate accumulation is actually we measure the total calcium and the ionized calcium ratio in the circuit. If it's more than 2.5, then this suggests a citrate accumulation. Then you may need to, either you have to temporarily stop the citrate, <clears throat> uh, temporarily stop the anticoagulation circuit for a while, and then you want to repeat monitor, or you have to change the anticoagulation. Okay? So monitoring is also the same for continuous mode of, uh, be it the renal, rep uh, renal replacement therapy or, or this uh, TPE. So you might make sure the vital sign is properly monitored hourly. And you also need to monitor a few bloods a few times, for example, blood gas, uh, red cell to make sure that it's no, sometimes you may not need to take a reticular site all the time. You just need to see whether your red cell count, actually the HP drop or not, and then whether any recovery in terms of the renal and the kidney function, uh, the, the liver and the kidney function, and then the electrolyte, especially the calcium. 
okay and the corrugation profile so this will be this will end the the continuous form of dialysis okay so now i talk about last part of the uh, lecture or the sharing is actually about kidney transplant I understand that i easily spend about almost one hour to talk about this uh this but i hope that this kind of uh, session can actually benefit everyone, not for exam purpose per se, because all these things can be quite technical and can be quite, quite advanced. But once you realize the, the basic principle of it, you realize that actually the, the theory behind it is actually quite simple. But it's something that's not commonly taught by anyone, any one of us, uh, be it when we are medical student or house officer or even medical officer sometimes, we may not encounter all these kind of uh, things being shared. So that's why it's also important for us to, to go through. Huh? Okay, so can you... Transplant is essentially a donor kidney that is placed uh, on top of a patient recipient kidney that is no longer functioning. Lah. And the benefit has shown the greatest as compared to those on dialysis, be it the PD or HD. And the best outcome is those patients that went for pre empty transplant before the kidney fails, meaning you transplant the kidney even before the kidney fails. Okay, And the benefit is also include cardiovascular benefit. Patient no need to go to any form of hemodynamic instability, you know, and Patient can have a better quality of life. No need to go to HD center three times per week. No need to uh, uh, do the PD themselves four times, four action, four to five exchange per day. You know? And it's eventually all these costs as you total up together, it's actually more cost effective. Okay. So let's go through a bit on the history of kidney transplant. Again, it's very boring, but it can be quite interesting. If you can see that in like the, the history of kidney transplant actually started quite late, right? It's like a recent like 120 years thing. Okay. In 19, almost in 1990s. So you can see that they, they have performed some uh suspend uh, uh animal study. They have performed some successful kidney transplant. Okay. And subsequently, uh they have tried with human to human, but actually never really succeeded. And they also have tried to multiple mouse model, also very not very good. And what what is next is that certain certainly there is some theory to, to discuss what is foreign and what is self and what is non-self. Remember when you talk about immunology, our body detects as self or non-self. Okay, so actually it's actually proposed by this Sir Frank McLean. Okay, so it actually described the theory of immunogenicity. And this experimental period, the exciting news is actually when 1954, when Yosef, uh, Dr. Yosef Murray performed the first successful human to human transplant from an identical brother okay it's, it's a basically a, it's a twin it's a twin form of renal transplant okay and because of twin they are same in terms of their abo they are same in terms of their hla and also everything almost the same the patient never required any uh uh immunosuppression oh huh? very interesting so that time those time there is no concept of immuno to to start patient on immunosuppression and what dose and what medication and how many combination they just transplant and blah and observe the urine and, and monitor the patient. Okay, very interesting, right? And it was until 1964, Dr. Pao actually started to uh, to actually have uh, created a lab test, cytotoxic dependent toxicity, or what we now know as CDC uh, cross match. Okay, at those times, they, they recognized the importance to do a cytotoxicity uh, screening and also looking at the reaction. And subsequently, more and more barriers being uh, overcome and we'll talk about all this medication later on but you can see that what happened is that we are having a lot of barriers not in terms of medication at this point of time it's more to our our availability of the donor okay our donor pool is very small and it's actually a very huge barrier in fact almost like one or two percent uh, out of the end stage kidney disease patient in malaysia that underwent kidney transplant one to two percent out of you know Probably about uh, 80 to 80, 87 to 88 percent actually go through hemodialysis. Another, you know, about 15 to 90, 90 or 20 percent actually go through uh, peritoneal dialysis. But kidney transplant is just one or two percent, very pathetic. But that is the one percent that actually can give the best outcome. Okay, so therefore we should know a bit on this. Okay, so this is actually uh, this is the twin brother when the doctor Murray actually performed the first uh, twin to twin transplant and they are actually both well okay and this actually published in NEJM because it's just a breakthrough in the history okay so how about Malaysia how how we did okay let's go back to our our Malaysian history then so in HKL actually performed the first living related uh, transplant back in 1975 okay we are not too bad if you look at the timeline 
1975 is actually somewhere in between the introduction of the immunosuppression. Oh, we are actually quite early. Malaysia is actually quite successful in this. So subsequently, a year later, HKR performed another uh, liver, uh, kidney transplant, but this time it's a disease donor transplant. Okay. And subsequently, Prince Scott Medical Center performed the first ABO incompatible transplant, which is a breakthrough because used to say, everyone used to uh, understand that ABO incompatible cannot be transplanted, but it's actually a wrong concept. The, this actually transplant proved that ABO incompatible still can be transplanted. You just need to desensitize the immune system before it's subjecting patient for transplant. And in 2021, uh, first hep C donor disease uh, transplant is actually done in Hospital Salaya. And recently, I think everyone heard about the news from the staff from the Facebook. Uh, UMC actually performed the first uh, RVD recipient knee transplant. And here's the team that's involved. Most of them are actually my bosses. But you can see that uh, actually it's a breakthrough followed by a breakthrough. So RVD per se shouldn't be a contraindication for kidney transplant. But you will be surprised that if you read through the transplant policy in different countries, most of it still label RVD stable, even fully full biological suppression kind of RVD is still relative contraindication. So that brings a lot of barrier and limited option for those RVD patients with end-stage kidney disease. Okay. But bear in mind that they are not contraindicated. Okay. Zero equivalent to zero, it still apply for transplant. Okay. Zero transmission and, and zero uh what the 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 concept by the ID team is always zero equivalent to zero, right? Uh zero uh viral viral rope meaning zero transmission okay so when we go for transplant this is just some basic thing uh, i mean it's not to have more details to, to bore everyone but pre transplant assessment is extensive workout that ideally be done in within a three months time we a lot of things that patient have to go through patient have to go like station game uh, do this and that do this and that go here and there so a lot of things they need to do okay but the idea is you must have a donor and you must have a recipient uh, huh? and the uh, immunophenotyping we're looking mainly at the abo the group for both donor and recipient, HRA typing, CDC cross match, flow, uh, NDA, if let's say it's ABO incompatible, and then DSA antibody. So you can see that immunophenotyping per se is also quite advanced. There's not many center in, in, in our country actually can do this. Okay. And history wise, what are the things that we are concerning? We, are, we need to know the primary disease because certainly sometimes certain disease can recur, can recur after the transplant, recur of de novo disease, right? And we need to know what patient have underwent through dialysis, surgical drug history, surgical, particularly the abdomen, any abdominal surgery, because it can provide some technical challenges for, for surgeon to go in. Drug, surgery, drug history, allergic history, smoking, alcohol, psychiatric assessment, also very important. Patient BMI, too obese cannot. No? So have to really cut down the weight first. And then what are the sensitizing event this is also important because transplant you're talking about immunogenicity you're talking about immuno uh, 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 compatibility okay just like hra typing and just like the dsa so those sensitizing event those patients that if you plan the patient if you think the patient is very young already reaching and sick kidney disease and there is an option for kidney transplant perhaps you should not transfuse the patient frequently if you really need to transfuse the patient you should use a leuco depleted uh leuco depleted pack cell you cannot just transfuse a normal uh pack cell because once you do that you sensitize the body immune system to produce some form of uh, uh de novo antibody that is not good unless the patient is going for transplant later more and more complicated so other than trans transfusion pregnancy and previous transplant is also uh two of the uh, sensitization event that we need to explore labs basically we just concerned about the the counts the usual uh result as well as the viral screening in particularly more on the cmv ebv sometimes we may take a bit more uh virology screening and for ladies uh we may consider to take pap smear as well to make sure the gynae part is uh, excluded no issue and then for cardio respiratory may need to make sure that the patient can go through the surgery safely at the same time make sure the patient because the patient is going to be started on immunosuppression after the uh, right before and also after the uh, surgery so therefore tb is something we must exclude huh? even if patient is latent tb then the latent tb should be treated first okay before suitable for transplant because once you start uh, immunosuppression then there's always risk of reactivation of tb okay so other than that like ecg x-ray exercise stress test echo and lung function test this is a compulsory thing and the imaging is important like for example for female ultrasound of the breast or your mammogram and CT, river, uh, CT renal four phase is also important, mainly for the anatomical aspect, so that the, the, the urologist 
the neurosurgeon actually can know the detailed anatomy of of the structure before they go in for transplant because transplant may not be so simple to us it's just like chamtong three things only right renal artery renal vein and also the the urethra right but actually it's not so straightforward sometimes the anatomical variation can make the surgery difficult okay so again a lot of things to go through but basically this is just a very uh will be interesting to know so that you will realize that if you you if you understand a bit on the history, you understand the rationale of giving immunosuppression. Why three drugs? Why must uh, have a steroid? Why must have a uh, calcineurin inhibitor and also the MMF? And can we go with two drugs? And why why certain combination cannot be done? And what are the options? So you can see that there's a lot of uh, involvement, uh, improvement, as well as a lot of studies involving uh, immunosuppression in kidney transplant. But basically, I just want to uh, highlight a few things is that you can see that probably I will just highlight uh, three or four studies that's most important. Canadian multi-center transplant study in 1983 in which initially they, they, they start to give everyone like steroid and also sometimes uh, in olden days they even give uh, medication that I cannot remember, one of the chemo drugs. But in 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 1983, they, they give steroid and they want to investigate, they, they have shown that steroid have actually increased graft survival after the transplant, but it's not good enough. So that's why they want to study whether uh, cyclosporine or azathioprine have any good effect to actually maintain a graft survival. So this is a Canadian multi-center transplant study that they do. They compare both and they found that actually cyclosporine is actually superior compared to azathioprine. And it actually can cause uh, more uh, graft survival. And therefore, at that point of time, the recommendation is to give cyclosporine with steroid. Okay, it was until 1996 that they add on microfinetic morphotel, which is the MMF, and they actually study a few arm. They compare low dose, high dose, as well as ASA, and they found that MMS is also more superior than ASA therapy. Now, it's very important because we all know that subsequently, at this day and age, we know that MMS is actually one of the anti metabolite, is more effective compared to ASA therapy. We only give azathioprine in pregnant, uh, in lady with pregnancy, okay? But we generally don't use aza because we know that the efficacy is actually lower compared to MMF. And in 1997, this is also another important thing. Uh, when we talk about immunosuppression, we talk about maintenance immunosuppression and also induction immunosuppression. When we want to induce the patient for surgery, uh, if we don't do, if we don't give anything other than steroid, the the surgery, the kidney uh, may have delayed graft function or even fail immediately, not a good outcome. So, but the study shown that if you give a bacillicimab, okay, one of the agents that I'm going to discuss later, it can actually reduce uh, reduce the, the rejection, okay? So that's why bacillicimab is actually recommended on top of steroid then. And how about Allied Symphony? Allied Symphony is very important trial because if you understand the history, you will know why nowadays no people or very seldom people will use cyclosporine anymore. Okay, everyone will use tacolimus in terms of uh, calcineurin inhibitor. It's all because of Allied Symphony study. It say actually it has four arms. They use standard dose uh, cyclosporine, low dose cyclosporine, low dose tacolimus, and also low dose silolimus. So, and this actually in combination with their standard uh, immunosuppression regime, which is the MMF on top of steroid. Okay, so what happened is that they found that actually low dose tacolimus is actually more superior than low dose uh, cyclosporine as well as low dose or, or even standard dose cyclosporine and it can also uh, more effective than low dose serolimus meaning to say that tacolimus is actually more superior compared to cyclosporine okay so for now on you will see that from 2007 onwards you will see that more and more patients switch from cyclosporine to tacolimus and those patients new 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 transplant patient they will be started definitely on tacolimus okay so that is the reason that brought the that, that's why this is called landmark study because it changed the management. Okay, and subsequently, Freedom study shows that uh, if you give a steroid free in as a maintenance versus uh, you withdraw the steroid or you give standard steroid, what are the outcome? It, it shows that actually you, you maintain the patient on long-term steroid, they will have a lot of steroid related side effect. But if you withdraw the steroid, somehow the, the kidney may go into rejection. Okay, so meaning to say steroid still be needed is a is a very hate and love relationship. You want steroid, but at the same time you don't want steroid. Okay, so next is actually uh converts trial actually uh they actually compare calcineurin inhibitor particularly tacolimus and versus silolimus whether there's any benefit or not, and they found that actually 
synonymous may also have low because last time when they do an allied study they use low dose right now about how how about they use standard dose and they found that actually they are actually non inferior mean to say this is also another good option and benefit i won't discuss because it's not available in malaysia but 2014 it come up uh, this is another induction protocol study in which they compare bacilizumab which is already known to be useful as an induction agent they compare with elantuzumab and they found that elantuzumab also have beneficial uh, advantage okay in terms of induct uh, inducing the patient okay and harmony studies another perhaps the last two studies the important study in which it shows that uh, hemoglobin as well as bacillus both can be used uh, for induction uh, uh, induction immunosuppression the both of them can be used but need to decide and need to choose the patient immunological profile okay and the last one, the transform study in 2018, it shows that actually this is also a very important study because this study actually shows the superiority of the Everolimus, one of the mTOR inhibitor, uh, as compared to uh, microphenolate morphotel. Okay, it shows that Everolimus have, uh, you, you can see that this one, MPA is actually plus with carcinolate inhibitor plus with steroid. And this Everolimus is actually uh, used together with low dose uh, carcinolate inhibitor, which is a low dose tacrolimus and without steroid. So two drug regime. So you are using evolimus plus uh, low dose uh, carcinogenic inhibitor, or you are using evolimus plus uh, standard dose carcinogenic inhibitor plus steroid, something like that. And they found out that evolimus actually not even uh, not only uh, non inferior to microphenolate plus tacrolimus plus steroid is in fact is more superior. Okay, so you can see that this transform study really make the evolimus uh, a very famous drug. Okay, so having known all this uh, trial and all this uh, development, then you realize that why the immunosuppression is like that. So induction uh, immunosuppression, we definitely need a backbone immunosuppression of metal prep. And you can choose between three of these, okay? Either T-cell depleting or anti-IL2. Anti-IL2 is just the bacilizumab, okay? T-cell depleting agent is the ATG, okay? The, the derived from the rabbit or the, from the horse, or that is elantuzumab, okay? So this is all based on study. So how, but basically in principle, in all transplant center, usually we only have uh, ATG or we only have bacillicimab. Usually we only use this tool. Huh? And with Tuximab and ntc 20 we generally use for desensitization protocol before the transplant or even after the transplant, if patient have rejection. We don't use it routinely as a first line. But first line is always metalpred together with uh, ATG or bacillicimab. In terms of maintenance, the three immunosuppression backbone that we always know is the pregnisolone as a backbone, carcinogenic inhibitor, preferably tacrolimus, because it's shown more superior, right, based on the trial, and the anti-metabolic MMF or MM MPA, if you've got GI issue. And you can see that, oh yeah, the steroid was repetitively, you can just ignore. If, let's say, patient got any, but the problem with carcinogenic inhibitor is actually the side effect in which it can lead to a lot of metabolic syndrome huh, and can also eventually lead to some... Uh, 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 malignancy related post transplant uh, lymphoproliferative disease, skin cancer, all those things. And therefore, sometimes uh, CNN can be quite nasty. And if let's say that happens, you have to switch to mTOR inhibitor or uh, the new agent I won't be discussing, the set things like that. Okay. So, induction how to choose bacillicimab or ATG, anti thermocyclobulin. So, general principle is if patient is highly immunogenic, Meaning to say, patient got multiple sensitizing event. Patient got a lot of HRA mismatch, and patient is also like uh, the donor, the the, the old the, the kidney is too old, but the patient is very young, and therefore this age discrepancy also will trigger a lot of immunogenicity, and the the the, the all the antibodies like you know uh, PRA, which is the DSA antibody, is positive, and then the ABO incompatible. All these very high immunological risk, you should actually choose ATG. As compared to low immunological risk, which is like no mismatch at all, uh, living donor, okay, and then there's no PIA or even low PIA title, and then the blood group was compatible, and then the ischemia co time was like very short, immediate graft function, or even first transplant. So you can see that all this very low immunogenicity kind of patient profile uh, is suitable for bacillicimab, but high immunological risk is actually suitable for ATG, okay? So we only use these two, basically, either one. So now go to carcinogenic inhibitor, January 2, as we mentioned, tacrolimus is more is, is very well established and it's more superior as compared to cyclosporine. <clears throat> January is also more potent and less vessel constriction, less fibrogenic. And how we remember the mnemonic uh, for 
harm for all the side effects. I generally remember the new onset diabetes of the uh because of the medication, the non that so therefore ends up in neuropathy. Patient can have a lot of headache, seizure. There is some patient that really have seizure after started on tacolimus though, uh, especially when the PDM is very high, toxic level. So neuropathy can occur, nephropathy also can occur, uh, diabetes definitely, alopecia and tremor and hypertension. These are the side effects, common side effects of uh, tacolimus. Okay? Psychosporin, less, in, uh, less popular because the study has shown that it's inferior uh, and also it actually has a higher level of rejection rate as compared to tacolimus and also and prolonged usage can actually lead to chronic allograft nephropathy no and what are the harms everything psychosporin is large it can be large gum uh, hair also a lot bp also very high lipid also very high so it's like a lot of things huh? so that's how you remember how about anti-metabolic versus mTOR? Okay, microfinet morphotel is, is very well established based on what we have go through the study. And the harm is actually lies with the GI side effect. Most people cannot tolerate the microfinolate, the MMF, the, the, the generic one. And therefore, you may need to switch the patient to MPA, the enteric coated one, which is more uh, tolerant. And microfinolate morphotel, generally, you need to uh, make sure that you check the full blood count, make sure that patient not in immunosuppression. Uh, over suppression causes uh, uh, bicytopenia or even pancytopenia or even uh, like pellet low or white cell low and uh, teratogenic is also very well recognized that's why that's why it's not not uh, not recommended to give in pregnant lady at all because of the teratogenicity evolimus has a lot of benefit uh, uh, roles and at the same time also has some side effect as well you can see that it's actually anti proliferative agent and good thing about this uh, evolimus is actually it can it's somewhat like an anti-cancer therapy. It can prevent the those uh, mutation to occur, prevent uh, actually those de novo malignancy to develop. And it also has antiviral effect. Study has shown that those post-transplant patients, they have reduced uh, viremia. Okay, this is proven in the transform trial that we go through just now. It has less onset of BK virus onset uh, nephropathy or CMV nef uh, CMV. Uh, uh, bacteremia or even nephritis and can also reduce maize outcome okay it's cardioprotective in a way and also similar efficacy compared to te uh, tacolimus based on the transplant trial as well and they also they also found that because they actually this medication kind of like protects and modulate the immune system this antiviral effect seems to extend even to the covid patient in which they the when the trial was continued during the covid era they found that patient on Evolimus has actually less uh, progression of severe COVID as well. And the, those patients that go for COVID vaccine jab, they also found that the title of the vaccine is actually higher. Okay, And Evolimus is a good thing is that it does not induce the de novo DSA production. Okay, Immunosuppression can also cause uh, uh, immunogenicity to the uh, our native immune system and therefore actually cause antibody production. What are the harm? Evolimus actually can have some, you know, oral ulcer, proteinuria, and then lymphocyte can happen after the transplant sometimes, as well as delay wound healing. And sometimes prolonged usage, not enough study yet. Uh, prolonged usage may actually injure the lung, causing some form of ILD. But the, 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 the adverse event is actually not very significant, very rare, but something to take note. And surgical complication after the transplant, you can rewind into early or late. Early, basically, if the vessel are thrombosed, infected bleeding or even the urine is leaking so the problem can either come with the vessel which is the renal artery or renal vein not being uh, uh, implanted properly or it can be due to the urine the ureter not not i mean the system not easily because they have to transfer into the bladder it's not easy and they may have some urine leak and bleeding and infection can happen in, in any time okay delay is basically those collection like lymphocyte urema sorry urinoma and also sometimes they will put in the stand after the patient <clears throat> transplanted, right? The, the, the stand may get encrusted, cannot remove. Huh? And sometimes it can actually have some ureteric stricture as well. So about how the more important thing for, for, in, for, for our level is actually the medical complication. I always like to imagine when I <clears throat> talk about complication, when we look for short cases, right? I always want to I always remember in my mind there will be either side effect from under suppression or over suppression. What happens you, if you under suppress a patient? You will make the kidney easier to be to reject, right? And the graft function will actually delay. It means the kidney, the, the, the transplanted kidney cannot function well because 
always have this ongoing insult from the from the uh, donor, not the donor, the recipient immune system. And rejection is something that we need to really uh, uh, highlight, whether in terms of the timing or the or the types of the rejection. And if you under suppress the kidney, it can also lead to recurrence of the primary disease as well. Okay. The, it, it may have may happen with or without immunosuppression, not very strong, but it can happen. And how about if you over suppress a patient, you predispose to infection, metabolic complication, that's why the TKI, uh, not the TKI, the tacolimus is actually, the FK is actually very, uh, very nasty in the sense of causing a lot of metabolic complication and cardiovascular complication as well and malignancy. So these are, these are actually a very important, uh, if you go to any conference or any talk about infection in post liver, uh, post kidney transplant or post solid organ transplant as well, even like, you know, bone marrow transplant or liver transplant or anything, they will definitely come up with this chart, okay? Solid organ transplant recipient, what are the infection risks and what are the organisms that you need to suspect? Generally, early, you are suspecting more like hospital-acquired infection. And somewhere between uh, one month to six months, you are talking about all those immunosuppressed, like HIV kind of related, those immunosuppressed patients uh, only get those infections. And but, the, but peculiar to the renal transplant is the uh, BK virus as well as the CMV. However, the less of it can also can get from, from anywhere. Like, for example, like uh, parasitic infection and all those things. And more than six months is more to commonly acquired kind of, kind of infection once the immunosuppression is being stabilized. So it's very easy to remember, like, like less than one month is more like hospital acquired. One to six months is more like very immunosuppressed patient that usually gets. And more than six months is more chronic, okay? And more like community acquired. And with that, I will end our sharing for today. Anyone have any question before we end the session? I understand it's very long. I try to make it like very uh, colorful and a very simple concept so that everyone can understand. It's basically just to increase the awareness of everyone towards uh, kidney replacement therapy and something about kidney. Huh? Okay, any question? You can unmute yourself if you have. Mm. It's a bit late, right? So perhaps I will just uh, and it, uh, call it a day, okay? So, yeah, sorry for taking everyone time. It's like, you know, almost 10, 10.30, right? Yeah. Any possible...